Join us on the road show. Put down the turkey legs and the eggnog, put on that new Christmas sweater, and get ready to enjoy the hateful eight in glorious 70 millimeter. <laughs> Upon winning his second Oscar for best original screenplay for the Western Django Unchained, Quentin Tarantino wanted to ride it high by helming another Western. This one less in the style of revisionist history and more under the umbrella of the sorts of TV westerns that had lunchbox tie-ins. Getting the hateful eight to the big screen, like the really big screen, was not easy. Plagued by uncooperative weather, technological tiptoeing, two significant leaks, and claims of its writer-director being both a cop-hater and a misogynist, The Hateful Eight was one of Tarantino's most difficult shoots and one of his worst-received films. So tighten up that noose and tune up the Martin guitar as we find out what the f*** happened to this movie. Quentin Tarantino got the stagecoach wheels rolling on The Hateful Eight when he announced it less than one year after Django Unchained hit theaters. In fact, the announcement wasn't the only thing that was close. Hateful Eight actually started as a sequel to Django, with parts of it stemming from an abandoned novelization of his revisionist western. For this western, Tarantino would use Western TV show tropes, chiefly the bottle episodes where a band of vigilantes took the lead hostage. He thought, what if I did a movie starring nothing but those characters? No heroes, just a bunch of nefarious guys in a room, all telling backstories that may or may not be true. Trap those guys together in a room with a blizzard outside, give them guns and see what happens. And what happened was a lot of anger, a lot of snow, and a lot of vomit. <laughs> And it almost never happened. In January 2014, less than two months after unveiling the project, the script leaked. Tarantino strongly considered hanging up the project higher than Daisy Domergue, saying, I've got 10 more where that came from, which we know he does not because he's limited himself to 10 films overall. He thought about turning it into a novel before settling, at least temporarily, on doing a live reading. And so in April 2014, Tarantino hosted a live reading of the screenplay's first draft with a lot of what would become the final cast, albeit adding Amber Tamblyn as Daisy. Eventually, it was Samuel L. Jackson who convinced Tarantino to just make the movie. Don't be a pussy. Who leaked the script, a situation that left Tarantino very, very depressed, was a bigger question than who poisoned the coffee. Tarantino narrowed it down to a handful of people, including stars Bruce Dern, Michael Madsen, and Tim Roth, who already played the Fink in Reservoir Dogs. And he more or less ultimately blamed shifty agents. The culprit remains unknown to this day, but it would be the ultimate Dernsey, just saying. With the go-ahead from Jackson, Tarantino set about casting the titular octet, which he said, quote, needs to be an ensemble where nobody is more important than anybody else. And so... There was Samuel L. Jackson in their sixth collaboration as Major Marquis Warren, Kurt Russell as John Ruth, aka The Hangman, Jennifer Jason Lee as Daisy Domergue, described as Susan Atkins of the Wild West, reportedly also considered were Gina Davis, Demi Moore, Hilary Swank, Michelle Williams, Evan Rachel Wood, and more. Walter Goggins as Chris Mannix, Damian Bashir as Senior Bob, Tim Roth as Oswaldo Mowbray, He's later revealed to be Pete Hickox, later confirmed to be the great-grandfather to Michael Fassbender's Lieutenant Archie Hickox in Inglorious Bastards, Bruce Stern as General Sanford Smithers, and Michael Madsen as Joe Gage. At one point, Viggo Mortensen was attached, but had to ditch the film due to scheduling issues. He also previously auditioned for Reservoir Dogs in an undisclosed role. With a budget pegged around $44 million, which raised exponentially once cameras started rolling, production began on The Hateful Eight in January 2015. And while the shoot wasn't exactly plagued with problems, those that did occur were a mixture of those in and out of the crew's control. One of the most publicized stories surrounding The Hateful Eight had to do with its shooting method. 
as Tarantino decided to film it in glorious 65mm. Cinematographer Robert Richardson of Kill Bill and Inglorious Bastards used Ultra Panavision 70 lenses, the widest format available. The aspect ratio, 2.76 to 1. They're so uncommon that Richardson was under the impression they no longer existed. So rare they are, The Hateful Eight would be one of under a dozen movies to use those lenses, the most recent being 1966's Khartoum, meaning they would have to be retrofitted on modern technology. For her cameras, Richardson would also use Panavision 65 HR camera and Panavision Panaflex System 65 Studio, along with Kodak Vision 3 200T 5213, and Vision 3 500 t 5219 film stocks. As the weather was harsh, the team had to go through various tests to make sure they would work under the weather conditions. At times, they had to keep blankets over the cameras to protect the fragile equipment. After all, temperatures would plummet to negative 10 to 20 degrees, which actually doesn't make QT's desired 35 degree sets seem so bad. Production took place exclusively in Colorado, with much of the action taking place at Minnie's Haberdashery. Another major issue arose from its Colorado locale. The snow was unpredictable, and so the shooting schedule would often change based on the weather. Got snow? Shoot the exteriors. Overcast? Get in the stagecoach. In some instances, the production had to use fake snow, as Mother Nature can be a real mother. And so can handling an antique. In the movie, after Daisy finishes a rather lovely rendition of Jim Jones at Botany Bay, John Ruth snatches her guitar and smashes it to pieces. Unfortunately, that was not a prop guitar. Unbeknownst to Kurt Russell, it was actually an antique C.F. Martin and Company guitar from the 1870s, valued at $40,000. So when Daisy is shocked, it's also Jennifer Jason Lee that can't believe what just happened. <laughs> The director of Martin Guitar Museum, who loaned the guitar, said, quote, Upon inspection of the pieces, we realized that the guitar was beyond fixing. It's destroyed. The museum now refuses to loan out guitars to film productions. But not all musical notes were sour. <laughs> For the score, Quentin Tarantino enlisted legendary composer Ennio Morricone, who he tried to nab for Inglorious Bastards. In addition to a wealth of memorable soundtracks, Morricone also composed some of the most iconic Western scores ever. His work on the good, the bad, and the ugly practically defines the genre. He slightly resents that association uh, that why is everyone going on about Westerns all the time? He hates the phrase spaghetti Westerns because he thinks it's a huge put down beneath him as a composer. He hadn't composed one for a Western in over three decades. Mi disturba moltissimo. I get really annoyed because even though only 8% of my film scores were for Westerns, most people only remember me for those films. The collaboration went off without a hitch, although there was some minor controversy after Marconi apparently made disparaging remarks about QT's use of his music in Django Unchained. Music was also used from The Exorcist 2 and The Thing, a movie also scored by Morricone and that greatly influenced the visuals of The Hateful Eight. The soundtrack was padded out with songs from The White Stripes, Roy Orbison, and Wes Craven's The Last House on the Left, adding more genuine horror to the film. <laughs> with production wrapped, The Hateful Eight could finally be released in two versions. The Roadshow was undoubtedly the bigger draw. Running 187 minutes, the Roadshow version, like the 70mm presentation, offered a throwback to an entirely different era of moviegoing. There would be an intermission and a physical program that also served as a souvenir. Many of you probably still have yours. It was, in other words, an event. But to pull it off, around 100 theaters had to be equipped with the necessary technology for proper presentation. Oh, and there would also be a general release for the peons out there, with parts cut out that don't change the story but may not have seemed as grand on your couch. This version was on 2400 plus screens. Ahead of both releases, The Hateful Eight was hit with its second leak, the same week Tarantino was getting his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. This time, DVD screeners got out threatening its box office numbers. But we won't blame Bruce Dern on this one. Even still, The Hateful Eight pulled in $155 million worldwide. Considering the screener incident and an active police protest, they didn't dig QT attending a BLM rally and calling cops that murder uh, murderers. 
it did quite well. Even if it did debut at number three in its wide release behind The Force Awakens and the Will Ferrell Mark Wahlberg comedy Daddy's Home. But forget Daddy's Home. Oh, you did already. <laughs> As it turns out, Disney put a stranglehold on the Cinerama Dome in Los Angeles, saying it could only play The Force Awakens and not The Hateful Eight. They are going out of their way to f me. As far as I'm concerned, let all of the entertainment reporters call up Disney. As of now and ask for their comments about their extortionist practices. The Hateful Eight did eventually play there, but Tarantino swore off the House of Mouse forever. Can we assume he doesn't have a Disney Plus account? The Hateful Eight would earn just three Academy Award nominations, the lowest since the one for 1997's Jackie Brown, not counting Kill Bill and Death Proof, which had zero. The nominations? Best Supporting Actress for Jennifer Jason Leigh, Best Cinematography, and Best Score. The only statue went to Ennio Morricone, winning his first statue in six nominations, becoming the oldest recipient in history at 87. It would end up being his penultimate score, as Morricone died in 2022. But that wouldn't be the last of The Hateful Eight. In 2019, Netflix debuted The Hateful Eight Extended Version which made the film a four-part miniseries that ran 26 minutes longer than even the Roadshow version. It, like the Roadshow version, had a relatively limited run, staying on the streaming service for under four years. While reviews were fine, The Hateful Eight stands as one of Tarantino's worst-reviewed movies. It's a bit cluttered, a bit overwritten, a bit unmemorable, and there are also moments that feel like self-parody, something even the greatest artists can fall into. No matter which version you watch, The Roadshow, The General, or The Extended, it still feels like lesser Tarantino. But this can be debated endlessly. As for us, we have to go. Old Mary Todd is calling. Listen, Bob, Quentin's a weirdo. He just wants to show his goddamn movie there. You got, you're got sitting on top of the world. You got Star Wars. Do me a favor, Bobby, for me. And you know we've had many private conversations. I, I f***ing partied with this guy over at Jimmy Kimmel's. Uh, be a gracious man. I want Quentin to show this new movie. He's worked his ass off. He wants the equipment. Hey, Filet, would you do it for me? So it's Christmas, Christ's sake. Ah!